Um, really an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today to host Delphine Schrank uh, with the launch of her book, uh, The Rebel of Rangoon. Um, my name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. Uh, really a privilege to, to be here on behalf of CSIS to welcome Delphine and to congratulate her on her fantastic book. Um, I'm by no stretch an Asia expert nor a Burma expert, so uh, caveats up front. But CSIS is uh, world renowned for its Asia program. Uh, Ernie Bauer runs the Southeast Asia program with great expertise. Uh, Mike Green, former colleague of mine from the Bush administration, uh, vice president for the Asia program uh, and the Japan chair. And then Victor Cha, as you all know, uh, the Korea chair, a great expert on uh, Korean and Asian issues. So CSIS has uh, wonderful uh, expertise uh, in-house. And for those who are interested, obviously, please check the website, www.csis.org. Um, just so you're on your best behavior, I know we've been having some drinks tonight. Uh, this is being live streamed. Uh, so we are being joined by uh, not only Delphine's family, uh, hi Lenny, um, <laughs> but also uh, several folks that we know would be joining us online. So uh, what I'll do when we open this up for a, a broader discussion, uh, we'll ask you to take a mic and identify yourself. And that's not only for the purpose of our discussion, but for those who are watching uh, online. Um, it really is a pleasure to, to, uh, to be here with Delphine. She's uh, a remarkable woman, a remarkable journalist, and pr has produced a, a remarkable book. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to having a discussion with her and to hearing from the experts uh, in the space. We're joined by former ambassadors uh, and former uh, experts and, and those who've been stationed uh, in Burma. And so uh, really looking forward to hearing uh, their insights and expertise as well. Um, so welcome, Delphine. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, Delphine, let me, let me start first because <clears throat> the book does, I think, some, some remarkably important things. One, deep insights into, into Burma itself, um, deep insights into what a resistance movement, a democracy movement is and, and how it takes shape, uh, how it adapts to repression from an authoritarian regime, um, and how this plays out at the micro level as well as the geopolitical level. Uh, and I have to admit, I always have uh, a challenge and a bias of, of viewing uh, things from a macro geopolitical level. And what your book does, I think, incredibly well is to bring the reality and the human and the cultural dimensions of what is happening in Burma to life. Uh, and you do it with great, uh, great narrative expertise. Um, but let me ask you this, what drew you to Burma? Uh, obviously, you were the Washington Post Bur uh, Burma correspondent, uh, traveled in, in and out of Burma over a dozen times, um, did expert work in, in, uh, in reporting in a very repressive environment. But what drew you to Burma, and what drew you to write this book? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you for hosting this. Um, a really pleasure. Deeply honored to be here, and it's true, we have some real experts in, in the room. So as, as I was saying to Ambassador Dinger before, if I have trouble with your questions, I'm just going to punt them to, <laughs> over to you. Um, well, the question of what drew me to Burma, I, it was completely by accident that I was sent there by the Washington Post. And again, the person who sent me is also sitting in this room, and he happened to have written a book last week, which is phenomenal, and I'm just going to plug that for a minute. The Billion Dollar Spy, David Hoffman. But I was sent a few days after Tropical Cyclone Nargis in 2008. Uh, and I wasn't meant to be going there repeatedly. Um, I wasn't meant to go there more than once. I was just meant to go and cover uh, the most lethal natural disaster that the world had seen since the Asian tsunami in 2004. Uh, and this was a cyclone that hit Burma and hit the uh, rice production region, the Irrawaddy Delta and Rangoon, uh, with 105 mile per hour winds. 138,000 people were missing or dead. Uh, huge, huge numbers of people. And the military junta at the time uh, was dragging its feet, not allowing in humanitarian aid, certainly not allowing in foreign journalists they never really had um, since they had taken power in 1988. We shuffled. So I was sent in really in a mad scramble to just really find out what was going on and get to those storm-ravaged zones. But the minute I landed in Rangoon, I was like, we're using Burma and Rangoon. And yeah, we'll talk about we'll that talk in about a second. Yeah. But um, I was just, I was so struck by this, first of all, by this, this highly repressive regime in which people really were terribly afraid. You couldn't ask direct questions about politics. 
And I knew that, but at the same time, people, if I tried to ask a little bit about the situation of people in the street, they would sort of shut up like clams. Um, but within a few days, I really was struck by something else, which was a sort of spirit of dissidence or defiance. I wouldn't call it dissidence, even just defiance. People were angry and quietly angry and finding creative ways to get around the junta to bring help down to survivors of the storm. And so that was the first thing that really stuck with me, is I, in this un heartbreakingly beautiful land, in Rangoon, which is decaying and full of colonial architecture um, and terribly, terribly poor, there was clearly something going on that I had also been told wasn't there. Uh, and Sang Suu Kyi, the great democracy icon of Burma, was languishing somewhere in Rangoon under house arrest. And I, all I knew of Burma was that she was really, she was the democracy movement. Without her, there was nothing. Um, and all political resistance supposedly was a dead letter. And I started to feel that there was something different. And it struck a match in me because I'd grown up reading the literature of World War II. And I'd always asked myself, what would I do in a situation of occupation by the Nazis? Or something? Would I have the courage to become a resistance fighter? Does it take courage? I don't know. And so when I met the people who ended up being the, the protagonist of my book, I just, I, I really wanted to follow that through and understand that more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have to admit, when I was told of your book um, by your father um, and heard the title. <laughs> this is uh, a very nepotistic yeah, reason that I'm up it. here. Yeah. I'm happy to admit that. Her father's an American hero, by the way. But uh, in any event, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd assumed you were writing a book about the broader movement through the lens of Aung San Suu Kyi, right? the, the, the mythic figure of the democracy movement. But this is really about, as you've already described, sort of the grassroots movement. And you tell the story largely through the lens of a character you call Nwe, uh, and, and his community and his relationship to the, to, the, to the environment. Why did you pick Nwe? And what was it about him and, and his trajectory that that drove the narrative of your book? I should probably say the whole book is, in a way, an exploration of who Nwe is. And he's deliberately mysterious. And he was very mysterious to me when I first met him. I met him on my second trip. And I met him through an exile who I talked to, a, a leader of exile, a, a, a leading exile who um, had been a student activist and had fed the country. And I said, I want to talk to activists inside the country. And the minute he was able to put me in touch with some, I knew that it was, it was a larger web. Um, and I met one young man who invited a bunch of activists. And in walks someone else, 40 minutes late. And he has this confidence that you don't see from everyone else there. A lot of people talk to you sort of obliquely. Even if they were political activists in a very repressive environment, they still talked around issues. And they sort of sat to the side and looked, looked very physically. You could just see that they were looking at you, talking to you obliquely. He sat right down in front of me, 40 minutes late, and just it's like that really annoying kid in class who sort of usurps every question and gets it right. And, and then I followed, he asked me if I just wanted to hang out with him afterwards and meet more activists. So I would meet him at nighttime in the usual place. That was the address he would give me. And I mangled it several times. But we would always meet in these strange little back holes down in downtown Rangoon and I'd be talking to other activists. And then he, and then I went traveling and reporting around the country. When I came back, I tried to get in touch with him. And, Someone else picked up his cell phone, and I instantly knew that was that meant something was very wrong. Again, in Burma, where people don't really have cell phones, and people are very, very careful of what they say on the phone. And he'd been chased out of Rangoon, as it turned out. And then I met him on the way back when he'd sort of he'd been chased out by an intelligence agent. So that that was my first meeting with this young man, and he was, and that story ended up writing for the Washington Post. And I just thought, well, it's more than an 800-word story. His story, as I started to learn more about him and what he did and what he was up to. He was just such a fascinating example to me of the kinds of contradictions in a person uh, who ends up doing this kind of work and who has, maybe it's courage, maybe it's something else, to pursue a life of complete self-sacrifice in which you have to give up the university education. You can't fall in love for reasons that the book gets into. Um, and those are small things, maybe family members disappear into prison and terrible things happen that you don't want to admit. And yet you go on and you pursue this life where you know that could happen to you. Just fascinating to me. And then through him, I saw that he was very, very close. He was very close to Aung San Suu Kyi, although she was under house arrest. He would steal to her by night. And, and the world around him, I sort of just got to know. 
Fantastic. <laughs> Long-winded answer. So. Um, let's take just a step back, and, and part of this is perhaps for uh, those of us who aren't as expert on Burma to understand the nature of the authoritarian regime and the, the way that it implements repression. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is lexicon, because it's something you, gra you grapple with with the very title of your book, right? It's the, the regime changing the very name of the country, from Burma to Myanmar, uh, Rangoon to Yangon, moving the, the capital to the middle of the country, um, even changing its own name, right? It's the junta known as Slork, which sounds like some Battlestar Galactica name. So, <laughs> exactly. so I, I don't even, I can't even remember the name. The FDDC. State Peace and Development State Council. Development yes, Council. sounds very placid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But can you explain, before we get into the story of Nui and how the community has evolved over time and the role of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, what, is, what did you see, especially through Western eyes, uh, about the regime and how was it impacting the culture, the people, the environment? So the regime had been in place in, the first military coup in Burma was in 1962 and this was 10 years after the, 12 years after, uh, after Burma achieved independence from, from Britain. Uh, and they had 10 years of parliamentary democracy. And then General Nguyen takes over the country um, in the name of holding together the country from secessionist movements all around the fringes. And he impoverished the country, this country that had been the shining promise of Southeast Asia. And it was not, it had been wrecked by World War II. I'm being historical, but I think it gets us to where, what happened in the end. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the country was very resource rich and under, under General Nguyen, he turned it into a one party quasi-socialist state and started deeply impoverishing it. By 1988, uh, it took a small spark, a tea shop brawl, and also the demonetization of people's currencies and savings um, for there to be a massive uprising. A huge uprising, a year before the Berlin Wall fell, millions of people on the streets and someone was in the embassy there at the time, um, who happens to be in the audience. Um, and. Um, and, and the democracy movement that's written about here was, was, came into being at that time. And then there was a counter-revolution. Um, a new junta came into place. The military didn't retreat to the bar barracks. Um, and and the, the regime that they put in place was to get rid of the socialist one-party rule and supposedly impose a form of liberal market capitalism, and it ended up being a form of crony capitalism, and all ideology was gone, and you had a military regime in place that had its hands in all elements of society, the economy, even co-opting religion, so they didn't just have power over politics, they had power over everything, and controlled through fear, uh, and there were informers everywhere, and spies down the block, sort of roughly how they controlled. Yeah. And, and in terms of then how the community of activists and the democracy movement evolved, you know, you, you talk in great detail in the book about obviously the imprisonment, the sort of the cycles of being in and out, uh, the, the great stories that you tell of, um, you know, Nui being chased by the security agents. Um, how did the, the repression uh, and the nature of the regime impact the way that the democracy movement has evolved over time? So the members of the democracy movement is, to define them better, I suppose, um, it's quite broad. It, on, in 1988, there was this massive uprising, and there was a call for general elections. And from that, the, the people that had been protesting on the streets more or less spontaneously came together and formed a political party, the National League for Democracy, which Aung San Suu Kyi is the head of, um, or one of the three heads at the time. The others were former military officers who defected um, and decided that they wanted to relinquish any association with the military that had been horribly warped um, under the previous regime. And, um, and I've forgotten what your question was. No, <laughs> I'm so long-winded. This how, is the nature of my sentences. Yeah, they go on. I'm so no, no, sorry. And, and, and how the community sort of evolved. You yeah. know, one, one yeah, of and how they evolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, we'll talk about that. So, so, I'm sorry. So no, I'll okay. try to get to the, the answer. Um, so the, the, um, they evolved, well, first of all, they won that election in right. a huge landslide in right. 1990. The National League for Dem Democracy, despite the fact that the key leadership was already in prison mm -hmm. uh, and Sang Suu Kyi was already thrown under house arrest. 
Uh, so it be, th th that movement that began then had the legitimacy of winning fair and square a democratic election, which is very rare. I don't think there's another country in the world that, that had a democracy movement with it. A very clear win by a party, and they were never able to take power. Um, so they had, on the one hand, a, a legal political party. But then around that, you had all the students who had risen up in 1988 who were variously thrown into prison and who sort of stayed in and out of prison and came in and out of prison for the next 20 years. So you had people who were both trying to work within the parameters of a legal system that was entirely at the whimsy of the junta, um, but trying to work within that system to get into power nonviolently. And then you had people all around that who were sort of working in what would traditionally be called an underground and clandestinely. And initially thought street protest was the best way to maybe kick out the government and then found other ways, sort of ways that seem very close to civil society, teaching themselves about their rights, going out and teaching people about their rights so they could stand up for themselves, teaching people to help themselves. Delphine, are there one or two stories, you tell great stories in the, in the book and incredibly well, um, and I, I've got a couple of favorites, but are there one or two stories or vignettes that uh, stick out in your mind uh, that are important to sort of understanding the character of Nui or the, the movement itself? It, to the audience that may not have read your book yet. Yeah, no, and by sure. the way, the book is on sale. Um, <laughs> and Delphine has offered to, uh, to yeah, sign it, so please I, buy the book. I'd love to say something from the very end, although it sort of gives it away. I mean, the subhead of the book is a tale of defiance and deliverance. Um, and as we all know, I mean, it's actually not giving the ending away. Burma's kind of opened up a bit in the last couple of years. There's been um, a lot more space for these dissidents to become politicians as opposed to revolutionaries. So the, the, the two main protagonists end up in the last chapter of the book um, contesting in a by-election. And one of them becomes a member of, well, he, he's running for parliament. And I was with them when they were campaigning. Um, so they're out in the open talking about what they want to bring their country towards, or democracy, rule of law, changing the constitution. And, um, and I was with them as they had to, they, one of them had been, had not slept for 24 hours. He'd come from Rangoon, it was Nue. He'd come from Rangoon and it was to deliver Aung San Suu Kyi's speech to the Union Election Commission in Naypyidaw. So we're in Naypyidaw, I should say, which is this weird Pyongyang-like capital that the junta built from scratch in the middle of the country in 2005, uprooting Rangoon. The, the abode of kings. Or the something. abode of kings, it means the yeah. abode of kings, or the city of kings. Um, and, and, and monumental architecture, and it looks nothing like the other cities in Burma. And, uh, and, and the other protagonist, I call him Nigel, his real name is Nanyalin. Nigel, he was running for candidacy, candidacy in parliament in one of the constituencies in Naypyidaw. Uh, so the two of them happened to be together because they're friends and they, and they with Nigel. And they hadn't slept, one of them was preparing for Aung San Suu Kyi coming for a huge rally the next day. And it's by now it's almost 11.30 at night and we were trying to go to see a final moment on the stage. And suddenly there was an accident on the side of the road and, and we stopped and picked up these two people um, who were two casualties just randomly on the side of the highway and took him to a hospital. This in the huge modern new capital. And it turned out there was no doctor there, no running water. The two nurses who were there had no idea what they were doing. And the, the other person who was there representing the government was just interested in asking for names and addresses and names and completely symptomatic of the kind of bizarre, perverse bureaucracy and complete lack of healthcare and social services that the junta had created. And I just thought it was really significant of the kinds of struggle that they, they claimed to have been fighting for that they really implemented that in, in their response, which is just to stay there as late as they could through the night if need be to wait for a doctor to come along, yeah. never mind about their campaign anymore. So that was one thing that for me was pretty significant. Um, the other is right at the beginning of the book where Nui is getting chased out of it's Rangoon. It's a great, <laughs> um, great story. Or he's just, he's, he, he's, he's, he doesn't know why. He's leaving the NLD office and he sees an intelligence agent coming out from where the intelligence agents are seated in the hut opposite. And the guy's clearly following him. And he, well, first of all, he does something very counterintuitive, which is, he, well, it's not, it's not what James Bond would do, let's just say. Um, <laughs> And then, and then the minute he sort of gets on the bus to run away, um, his first thought um, was for the women around him. And, and 
for me, that was also pretty significant of who he is and the kinds of people they are. Which I don't mean to say they're heroes, but there's, there's a lot of goodness in them. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of thought for really why they, why they do what they do, which is for their community. Yeah. And I love the, the tale of, of the story of how the community in some ways buffers itself, right? The, the numbers um, and, and the use of humor and, and mocking to sort of yeah. deal with the, that yeah. sort of pressure. I think that's pretty typical, actually, yeah. of situations like this. I mean, you get the, the, the best humor in the most repressive places, I think. Right. The gallows humor is a way of diffusing the pain, the trauma. There's no other way than just to laugh about it. Right. There's no time to sit and pick at your wounds because they're too busy having to power forward through new, <laughs> through new people getting arrested in the middle of the night, new, new tragedies every day, and they just have to laugh about it and mm -hmm. move on. Delphine, there's a, there's a bit of romance around Burma, in part because it's such a closed society and, and there's, uh, there's a sort of the mythical dimensions of it. There's also a romance around the figure of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, uh, called anti by the, by the movement in a way. What, you know, how important is she uh, to where the movement was and, and currently, how important is, is she? And if I can add another question, you know, what, what types of compromises does a movement like this have to make as it enters the political arena? You know, when they move, as you tell in the story, from dissidents to politicians, what are the types of compromises that have to take place and, yeah. and hard decisions? I'd say Aung Suu Kyi is extremely important. I mean, in this book, for the fragment of time that I'm talking about, which is really from 2009 to 2013, so the tail end of a 50-year struggle, she was under house arrest until 2010, but she was, she was always the guiding light, even when she couldn't really talk, but she did. She found ways through her interlocutor. Uh, she's been, I think she's one of the reasons that Burma gets any attention in it at all, and they're the first to admit it. Other countries have very, very nasty, equally repressive regimes, but they don't have an Aung San Suu Kyi. North Korea doesn't have an Aung San Suu Kyi, for other reasons, obviously. Um, so to keep the attention on Burma, she's important. And within Burma, everything she's ever said, everything that she's, when she's, until recently, um, and lack thereof of what she hasn't said. But she, when she would come out of house arrest, any occasion, occasion she had, she would really tirelessly find ways to articulate people's aspirations and, and, and diffuse their fear. And she was also very good at laughing. And when you see her, and when you see her talking in front of people, she just, she's really relaxed. And she just kind of, it's like she just picked up, she's just sitting down talking to her friends. And, and people flock to her, they really do. There was a lot of talk while I was starting to go there that the chatter of foreign analysts that she maybe wasn't even very relevant anymore because she'd been so cut off, which was exactly the junta's intent. They kept her under house arrest, not in prison, so that she would be cut off even from her own people. So that's why she's been very important. But then the question of the compromise of what they had to make, again, related to her. So in 2012, the little by-election that the NLD contested wasn't a huge election. It was for only 48 seats initially in a parliament of about... A, 14 parliaments with about over 1,000 seats, a so tiny, tiny, tiny. And the NLD decided to contest this. It was the first election they contested since 1990. Um, and they won, again, in a landslide, and underestimating even their own power. And, um, and so since then, they've been in parliament, um, those, those candidates. And, and then other of the activists who'd been on the ground have been a little bit more vocal. And I think the compromise is that all of a sudden, I mean, it's the old thing about the poetry of revolution and then the prose of government, I think they still, they still very much hold to their principle um, of what they stand for, the big question of democracy and freedom and what is that and the constitution under which they're, they're, um, they are, they're in parliament and under which they have to legislate is, is deeply flawed and has real issues. Um, and they know that, but they're, they're working within that system to be able to... To, to bring about change. And the biggest compromise you've seen on this is that Aung San Suu Kyi hasn't spoken out more forcefully for our years and um, on behalf of the Rohingya people in Burma um, and the Muslims writ large who've obviously been suffering or who in the past, since 2012, been suffering massive communal violence. Um, mm -hmm. She hasn't really come out and really explicitly in the way that she used to very explicitly 
talk about the abuses that were going on. And I think that's, I mean, it, it seems very, very clear that that's because she knows that she's within a very tight situation. And the NLD party itself hasn't come out more explicitly and said, this is wrong. These people should, we, we've been fighting for rights for everyone in the country. It's not just for the Buddhists. It's for the Muslims as well who have been with us for generations. Um, and part of the reason for that, people say all the time, is because they want to win the next elections. I think it's also because they understand that to, 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 to ruffle the feathers of the military who still hold all the power is really possibly to set them back to where they were. They remember their history. They, don't, they, they remember that they won in a landslide in 1990 and the result was they were all thrown in jail and the, the results were completely neglected for 90 mm -hmm. years. So, I mean, 20 years. But. In terms of the regime itself, um, we've obviously had the opening um, Relax, uh, relaxing of the sanctions. Um, where would you say, sort of, politically, uh, the the regime is now? You know, the Washington Post came out recently with a an editorial, sort of uh, very critical of where the regime is on human rights for some of the reasons you've already described. Um, a lot of debate as to whether or not sanctions were effective or not, whether or not they should be maintained until there's further progress politically and in terms of human rights. What's your assessment of kind of where the regime is in terms of its opening to the rest of the world? Yeah. It's clear that economically the country has changed since, since those elections, well, I, 2012, since elections in 2010 and then 2011, I should just you know, briefly say the junta dissolved itself and a quasi parliamentary system came into place, not quasi, a parliamentary system, a quasi civilian government um, under a new constitution that the junta more or less wrote um, over 14 years. Um, and, and, as, and as a result of that, we've seen change in Burma um, because all of a sudden it's not a junta that's just issuing orders anymore. Now you have a real parliament, although how that came into being and who's in it and the military reserves, 25% block of seats, 25 block of seats uh, and 60% are the military back party, the NLD had boycotted. Um, but nonetheless, there have been reform since then and the new government that came into place eased censorship, released a huge amount of political prisoners and the most iconic ones who've since been out. Um, and now it seems, of course, that the, the reforms have, have, have stalled. And um, I think my sense is really adopting the sense of what the protagonists here would think, which there are no surprises to them. It's not that, that reforms have stalled or regressed, it's they've gone as far as they kind of were intended to go in the mm -hmm. first place. This was a top managed transition, as it were, that was written by the military, and it's happening exactly as they said it would. Uh, they wrote their own constitution. The constitution is functioning exactly as it's written, which is just recently there was a vote to allow Aung San Suu Kyi to be president. Um, which I mean, would involve changing a clause in the constitution that was deliberately written to prevent her from being president, 59F, which prevents anyone who has a spouse who's foreign or children who are foreign from being president or vice president. Um, and there was an effort to amend that clause and another clause uh, which was significantly written in to prevent the military losing power, which is that more than 75% have to vote in favor of any amendment to the constitution. Um, which is impossible because the 25% block of seats that have been allotted to the military uh, ensures that they all vote as a block, and they did, and they voted it down. Um, and so the constitutional question is kind of stalled. Um, the military retains power, but through a, a parliamentary system. But beyond that, I mean, there really has been significant change insofar as People are a lot less afraid to talk openly, to, to, to protest openly. And you, you read about this all the time. Just the other day, there were garment workers protesting for minimum wage. Oh, well, they've been doing that for a while. People in a gold mine protesting land grabs. Uh, students who are always protesting and always getting chucked in jail. But they're protesting every day. It's really significant in a country where this is impossible before. Um, and journalists are being more vocal. There's been a lot of change in that sense. Um, so what happens going forward, the 2015 elections in less than six months now, November 8th, that's sort of anyone's guess. Anyone th the, the, the presumption is that the NLD will win a majority and, and then will continue to push for constitutional change. But in the interim, they can speak open, and they can speak openly in parliament where they couldn't, and they can push forward change. Economically, the country has changed. Um, 
And so it's yeah. opening. And it yeah. sits, of course, not in total isolation. It sits between China and India. And um, as Lee Kuan Yew reminded Burma, they probably need U the US to counterbalance the influence of China. Um, for those of us who sort of pretend to sort of be students of balance of power and great power politics, where does Burma sit in your mind in the context of these other geopolitical forces at play, the rise of China, competition with India, the, the question yeah. of the US and Asia? Yeah. What, what's your sense of that? Well, part of the reason that the Junta changed itself and dissolved itself was the whole question of China, which is very fraught in Burma. There's a very complex relationship with China, but the Chinese, the China had become the biggest sponsor of the Junta and the biggest trade partner and the biggest supplier of military uh, of weaponry and, and, and also the biggest, the, the country that was reliant on, on Burmese resources on hydropower and oil and gas. And there was a fear that was just too much influence from China. And just to say China is that Burma, so Burma is situated, we should have a map, but um, China has a huge frontier with, with Burma, as does India and, and Thailand and Laos and Bangladesh. So, so on the one hand, there was a fear that China was becoming much, much too influential. Um, and India had been trying to push against that by also having better and better relations with the junta. Uh, and meanwhile, the US, I think it might even have been someone in this room who taught me that the, the US um, treated Burma almost as a boutique issue, didn't really necessarily have any economic issues in Burma, and so could have the luxury of its principles for a long time. But at the same time, respect the human rights uh, movement there and, and, and the 1990 elections and just have nothing to do economically with Burma. Uh, but of course, with the American pivot to Asia and the, and the fears of China's rise, Burma's been a very important uh, crossroads for the China, India, and ASEAN connection. Um, and as China was moving into Burma and through Burma getting a mouth to the Andaman Sea and building deep seaports, I think there was concern in Washington. It wasn't the only reason. Um, and again, Ambassador Dinger, I'm sure you can speak more to this. Um, there was concern in Washington that, that, that China might be getting Burma much too much into its sphere of influence. Um, that's certainly not the only reason that policy under the Obama administration shifted, um, which was to, Prior to President Obama, the policy on Burma had been effectively to, to not talk to the junta or to, to, to freeze off Burma as a prior. Um, and then the Obama administration decided to have more engagement with the junta that the sanctions regime by itself clearly had been no real result to it. The country was still very stagnant. Um, One last question, selfishly ask you like a thousand more, but um, <laughs> do you still keep in touch with Noe? Yeah. What, you, well, you, it, yes. what, what's going on with Noe now? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I the bookends a bit of ambiguity, deliberately. Um, and his life, I think, will be ambiguous. Um, his, what's happened to him now, I mean, it's not giving too much away to say that through the course of the book, he becomes a real political strategist. I mean, he sort of grew up, but at the same time, he was already, he'd already been in activism and a dissident for about 10, 10 years at the beginning of the book, 11. Um, and he's continuing to do what he was trying to do, which was build an underground, well, it's not so much, well, it's semi-underground, still semi, everything is still semi-underground there because they don't know what's going to happen. He's, he, he wants to educate, when I say they're dissidents, they're educators, really. They try to educate their people about their rights. So he's still doing that. He's, he still has his own network that sort of is trying to educate, that's loosely affiliated to the NLD party. And I think he's still very, he's still very, very involved in what the NLD is doing. He's still a kind of backdoor strategist for them. But he likes to be behind the scenes. Part of the reason I kept his name pseudonymous, he's very recognizable to people in Burma. I didn't change anything else about his life. But by keeping his name off, which he asked me initially. It was kind of actually his way of saying, please don't, because I don't want to be seen as a, I don't want to, well, that celebrity. I don't want the, the heroism. The, it would make, it would actually be very bad for his reputation, as it were. It would seem like he thought he was too big. Um, and he's very modest. I mean, they're all very modest about their role in the movement. They're the first to say, auntie, and Sang Suu Kyi is the one, but we're nothing, we're nothing, we're nothing, I'm nothing. Don't write about me, write about her, write about him. You know. 
So he's still very involved. I mean, he's a lifelong. His vocation is to be fighting for his country. And his ego, he has an ego, a big ego, but it, it, <laughs> he suppresses it in the name of, I mean, in terms of what he can do for himself. His conventional life is impossible. You can't lead a conventional life doing what they do, at least at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, let me open it up to all of you. Um, and I'm going to reserve the, the moderator's prerogative of one last question at the end. But um, let's now open it up to questions. We have microphones. So raise your hand, um, ask you to identify yourself, and ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Robin White, retired fire and service. I'm curious about how you managed to get around, how you managed to meet with all these people what the Junta thought about you, were you followed? <laughs> and um, just how did you do this when someone must have known you were talking to all these people? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I sort of had to be very old school journalist, I think in this age of digital um, journalism where you can go in with all kinds of equipment, satellite phones, and use the internet. When I first went into Burma, I had to be very, very careful that I didn't give away that I was a journalist. Um, because the minute they found out people were journalists, they'd instantly deport them. BBC journalist was recognized immediately, frog marched back onto a plane, and someone went to the NLD headquarters, a Korean journalist, and snapped a photo, and they immediately knew she was a journalist. So I, I went in and, but at the same time, there were very few foreigners when I first went into Burma. The only people that were there were aid workers, and they were very clearly there as aid workers. So it's, it seemed really illogical that they would even know that I was there as a, I said I was a tourist, and I falsified my, my, uh, my occupation, my history on the visa form, and I blame that on the editors of the Washington Post. I said, what should I do? They said, lie. And <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they did. Um, which they never say. You know, the Washington Post never lies, it's a, ever. It's a benign indictment of the yeah, media. Yeah, ever. No, but really, never. I mean, that was what was so surprising. I mean, the Washington Post is one of the few places that will never even allow its writers to use a pseudonym unless that's changed. I'm not mistaken, David. Um, so I lied, and I, and everything I go back. I don't even remember what my first lie was. But so I went in as a tourist, and I um, <laughs> and at the same time I couldn't contact. I had very, I had two contacts. One was a German man who wrote to me yesterday, who's um, who runs a human or, a humanitarian organization, and the other was a Burmese doctor. And I couldn't write to him. He had email access, but I couldn't tell him, "Hi, I'm with the Washington Post." Or email because I understood that everything was monitored, and it was. Um, so he met me at my hotel. And I was just really lucky because he, 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 I could tell him instantly, and he sort of took me around in his really broken down car, which is very typical, and I started meeting people through him. And, but then he told me later on, because there was a time when we sort of dashed into a side, there's so many stories around this, I'm not really answering it fully, but he, we dashed into a restaurant one day and he said, we're being followed. I said, really, where? I didn't, you know, and I, because... And I, the advice I'd been given before I went into Burma it was the first real foreign correspondence I'd done. From very, very seasoned foreign correspondents of the Post, half of whom had Pulitzers, they all said to me, oh, you'll rely on your instinct, go and, you know. And, but at the same time, you won't have instinct when you're there, you know, when you first get there, because you're, um, you, you, don't, you haven't developed it yet for yeah. this country. So I had to rely on people like this doctor. Um, and, and then he later told me, you know, at first I was really worried that you're a Washington Post reporter and I was helping you out, and, but actually you just come off as a curious tourist, so it's okay. <laughs> so I used that. I really used that. When he told me that, I used that kind of... And, then I, and they underestimated me, I think, the authorities, because I'm female and young-ish and young. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I think their, their perception is a nice thing. They, they assume that... that Western journalists from big papers and other places like that are men, and they look a certain way. And, and but I and and I was just really careful. I never used drivers or the same drivers. I hid my stuff. I hid my notebooks. I was I was paranoid. And my computer, I had a small computer. The Washington Post had given me a computer, and it said the Washington Post is a scroll. <laughs> so I had to wipe that from. But um, but then when I would go back, I do the same thing. I mean, it was always a question. And when I was leaving the country, I was always very worried because in my notebooks, I had obscure ways of writing people's names. I'm naturally disorganized, but I got doubly disorganized. But I kind of had my own disorganization. Then I rip up everything that was significant and try and, and hide everything else. I'm not a rip up anything that was significant. Just rip up anything I didn't need that would give away people's addresses. And, and then I would um, 
uh, I, I would hide everything else and just hope that I wouldn't get stopped. And then I couldn't get back into the country for quite a while, and I had appointments to Milan Sang Su Chi, and I figured it was because I, I had risen to the attention of uh, the government. But then I found out I was on the gray list, and I got back in yeah. and whatever that. So anyway, yeah. But there was a period where they didn't allow your visa. Yeah, yeah. there was a, in two different countries. Yeah. And again, I used my mother as an alibi. Sorry, mommy. <laughs> she couldn't get, she got go back in. But um, yeah, they, they knew that I was, um, or I don't know, they, my, apparently my passport was referred to the foreign ministry in Nepido. And I was really worried. I found a lot of people. I said, but I've never used a byline. I've never, I've been really careful. I pinball after sensitive interviews. I didn't go to the NLD office. Um, but I think it was just a question of, again, this is typical of the way that the military junta regime system worked. Uh, they could just arbitrarily do things with no real explanation, but then no real follow through either. I think if they, they were, I made a mistake when I tried to get a visa the time that I was first denied it in Bangkok. I tried to, I was, I was good. I came out of the country when my visa was expired because I had overstayed my visa a couple of times. But I went to get a new visa within a week because I had an appointment with Aung San Chi and I didn't want to muck around with that. I wanted to make sure that I was legitimate when I was there with a the visa. And they knew that, well, hang on, why are you getting a visa a week later? Something's not right. Mm -hmm. So they stopped. Anyway, so I just had to get around the system in bizarre ways. And, um, and it was always winging it. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Delphine, who is that douche? Uh, Carnegie Endowment, remarkable story. My question is, um, uh, could this have happened, the opening up, could it have happened like 20 years ago before the age of the internet? I'm just trying to understand whether what we always say, or many people say, that you know, globalization and the internet and the social media, et cetera, are playing a very important role in uh, in these popular movements, democratization around the world. Do you, do you, do you agree with that in the case of, uh, of Myanmar, Burma? Yeah, I think in the case of the generation that I'm, although I'm talking about older people too in this book, but, there's, but the, the young protagonists of this book really use the internet a lot, even though it was highly, highly censored in Burma and a very, very poor country um, where only, I think there were 300,000 users within the internet in the cities, but nowhere else. And this is a country of about, well now they've, discovered about 51 million, really small numbers, and, and the electricity cut out. I think it's easy, well, first of all, I should say, I think it's, it's easy to be too utopian about the power of the internet in a country like this. There's no such, I mean, Twitter is really used by people on the outside of the country, or was then, it's not really relevant to getting people to stand out in the streets, face the barrel of a gun, have their photos taken by plainclothes officer and have that matched, and they, to, to do that physically takes something else than communicating through internet. But the internet uh, became very, very helpful for young people particularly who started to know how to use it to somehow get around the sensors and get information from the outside world and information about themselves. Before this, they were, they were reliant entirely on the radio. So 20 years ago in 1990, or 1988, when they had their massive uprising, they've had nothing since like that. And it's a shame because I think there were, there, if maybe if there had been news and internet at the time, it might have turned into something else. Um, but the only way that they were able on, their, on the biggest day of the uprising, August 8th, 1988, which goes down in inf infamy for them, they, they call that the whole 1988, the movement of four eights, because August 8th, 1988, someone called for that protest through the radio. And there was only one radio station at the time, really, that they were listening to. It was BBC. And everyone heard and everyone poured into the streets. But beyond that, what they could do with that uh, was not much. Whereas now they have access instantly to, yeah, the information age allows them to understand what's going on. But in terms of the actual political changes that have happened, I don't know that they're so related to that, to the, to, to, to the internet. But it's very difficult to say that a country that had been hermetic can remain hermetic and closed and xenophobic in the way that it, than it did in the past. The borders have been very porous for years, um, and it, it means that there has been an interaction and a desire to open up that they just they can't hold back anymore, even from the higher levels. I don't know if that explained it very well. But, um. Yes, up here, please. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Brianna, and I'm currently an intern in the Office of East Asian Affairs at USAID. 
And I actually uh, study music as, a, as an expression of dissent in Burma during my undergrad, so I'm really interested in the creative ways you talk about that people would have dissent during the time period. But my question reflects more on the current um, ethnic violence that we're seeing in Burma, and particularly in relation to the NLD party. What is the sentiment within the party regarding the violence, even though they aren't openly speaking out about it? And do you feel that their silence weakens their legitimacy as a party advocating for democracy? That's a really good question. Well, the, the NLD, it's difficult to speak of them as a bloc because there are many, many different people within the NLD, including the young man at Ness, and there are Muslims within the NLD, and then there's Aung San Suu Kyi, who's the head of the party. As a party themselves, they've been tempered in what they've said, but they still stand up for, for the rights of everyone uh, in the country, including Muslims. Um, but the thing I'd say about the NLD is they've been in a position of minority in, in the government. They know this. So they're, they're, still, they're still fighting to have more power to be able to speak out and to implement the kinds of actions that a government should take. I think it's easy to focus on them and blame them for not doing more with regard to the communal violence. There's not that much they can do other than, but they should, I agree with you from the outside, from the Western perspective, it, it delegitimizes them if they don't come out and say, in this instance, the sort of ultra-nationalist movement led by a, a Buddhist monk and various others, um, they're wrong. They don't speak in the name of the Buddhist people. They don't speak in, in the name of what Burma should be. And I've not, unless I'm mistaken, I've not seen them say that anywhere. I haven't been back to Burma quite a while, but uh, nonetheless, I, yeah, they, they've sort of, but, but I think beyond that, um, no, I'll just, I'll leave it at that, unless, you know, <laughs> there's more that you want to know. But, yeah, it's. Other questions? Mr. Master, I hate to put you on the spot. Would, would you want, want to comment, comment on anything, either currently or otherwise? Oh, yeah. We can get a mic for the ambassador. Thanks very much for the, the presentation and for writing the book. Uh, the embassy in Rangoon, the American embassy, and, and others as well have, have attempted to foster uh, the, the civil society instincts in the people there. And, and I think, I haven't yet read the book, but I, I gather you captured it very well, that, that these instincts have always been there. And, uh, and it was important to, to develop them to the extent it was it could be done in the repressive environment that was there at the time. One of the things that I think has, has uh, facilitated the, the transition that's taken place so far um, relates to the American Center. Uh, I don't know if you ever got the chance yeah, to go no, there. Yeah, definitely. I met a lot of activists there. Okay. I yeah, I mean, there, it, it's quite an amazing place, and it's, it's set up by the U.S. Information Service. And, uh, and we did a, an election a U.S. election event there in 2008, uh, both for the election and for the inaugural address. And in both cases, overflow crowds and uh, absolutely interested in what a free and fair election could look like. And when President Obama, in his inaugural speech, uh, mentioned that uh, if you'll unclench your fists, you repressive regimes in the world, if you'll unclench your fists, we'll extend our hand, uh, that resonated incredibly uh, in the audience at the American Center. I think it also resonated to an extent in Napido. As you suggested, uh, they had their own reasons for wanting to move into a transition of some sort. But uh, that offer, I think, contributed to it as well. Yeah. That's fantastic insight. Yeah. And I would say the American Center, and just to follow up on that, the American Center was incredibly important as far as I could tell. I mean, I'm not just saying that as, <laughs> as I happen to be in Washington here. <laughs> From, from what I could gather, and they're really, I think this is one of the few countries in the world, I've not been to North Korea, which I think is even worse, but I think there are really very, very few countries in the world that had this kind of it, a, a repressive regime on so many levels, and, and spies over the shoulder, and people really afraid to speak anywhere openly. But the American Center and the British Embassy's cultural wing, particularly the American Center, were very, very important for people to be able to come and learn about democracy, and a lot of the activists who came out of prison really relied on it. And there were a lot of informers there too, as I understand. But, but it was amazing the first time I went there and I saw the list of, of, of books that people were requesting. And they would ask for things like, please get us Farid, Farid Zakaria's, what was that wonderful book he wrote on the liberal, you know, 
Thomas Paine, Common Sense, and books that were censored that they could never get a hold of, but they knew and, and they wanted that, and the American Center allowed them to, to have that. Yes, yeah, so let's wait for a mic, though, so folks can hear. Uh, Mike Rosetic, PBS Online News Hour. Uh, I was just there in February, and I was somewhat distressed to see all the other embassies are right in the center of the city, including the British Cultural Center that you mentioned. The American embassy has been moved way out to the suburbs, and uh, <laughs> it's not accessible. I guess maybe you can get there by bus or something. <laughs> and like all the other embassies, because of the security, there's all these walls and barbed wire and everything. And I'm just wondering, in those circumstances, do the local people feel welcome? And do they go to, is there a library that they can go to? Or is this yet just another security compound that houses American diplomats? I should let the ambassador answer. But I will say that the new embassy is three doors down from Aung San Suu Kyi's villa, which is a major center. Of, so actually, it's not that. It, yeah, it's out of the downtown downtown. But at the same time, it's her villa is a, a major focus point of communal action. Yeah, and it's literally, it's on the same road. It's University Avenue. But, and the American Center is in a different, it's a different location. It's in a different location. So, um, yeah. And I don't know that people really come to the embassies that much, but that's, yeah, so it's accessible. And Rangoon is huge, so it's, well, relatively. <laughs> um, I think the American yeah, currently is probably nearer to the center of Rangoon than downtown. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Marilyn Myers. I'm also retired Foreign Service, and I was chargé in Rangoon in the mid-'90s for two years. Uh, to pick up on the American Center, uh, USIS, um, when, you're, when you're putting out publicity, you always want to know who your target audiences are. I mean, who's coming, who's responding. And what uh, the uh, center was doing then had a huge satellite dish and w was pulling down every day what was then known as the McNeil Lair News Hour. So this shows how <laughs> far back we're going. Little nod to the PBS. And, and, they would, and, and the center was showing this. And all these people would come in, uh, in their lingerie, et cetera, et cetera, and watch and then go away. I mean, young people, older people, across the board folks. And so I said to the center director at one point, uh, Doug Barnes, I said, Doug, who's coming? Who's your target audiences? Where's your list of who's showing up? And he looked at me and he said, Marilyn, I don't keep a list. If I keep a list, somebody's going to come looking for the list. And I said, you're absolutely right. So uh, he was right on on that. But we really were pulling in people, and they appreciated what they were able to see. Thank you. I think one more question up front here. All right, we'll, we'll do two. <laughs> we'll do two. If Duffy, yeah, that's OK sure. with you. Uh, my name is Luen, uh, Voice of America Burma, Burmese Service, former uh, activist as well. Um, Welcome. I, yeah, I haven't read your book, but uh, <laughs> I guess that, that um, I, uh, you have uh, talked to or met with a lot of uh, activists and our politicians alike in Burma. So um, it's a kind of a general question. You know, what do you think that uh, what all those, uh, including Noel, uh, all those uh, young activists, what do they want from America? From America? Well, for one thing, they really look to America. It's, it sounds such like such a platitude, but they, it's the freedom that America represents really genuinely. I'm French and American by nationality, and I say that because I've gone into Burma a lot on my French passport because it was easier, it was less suspicious to authorities here, maybe. Um, but when I tell people there, I'm French, and for me, France is like America. It stands for freedom. And they say, oh, Zidane, the football player, you know, Zidane. <laughs> and you say, America, freedom. Obama, you know, they, they really, uh, so what do they want from America? Again, I think Ambassador Dinger can answer this too, but I, I, I think they want the, the idea that America represents, not to, you, not to have the same idea of freedom in Burma. And I try to get into this in the book a little bit, that the idea of freedom in Burma is slightly different, culturally specific to Buddhism and ideas about that. Very expansive, more expansive maybe. But, um, but the, the idea of a democracy that's functioning, a, a system of, I, there, I mean, it depends on the person. Some people would look to, some one dissident in there, get into it. 
looked at sort of the Madisonian model, and maybe they could impose that, and ideas about democracy from America. But I think also to, to have actually American businesses now, I, as I understand, as I've seen, people really welcome it. I mean, the sanctions question was very, very controversial within Burma, as it is in any other country, about whether it worked, whether it didn't. Was it the lever of influence that made the junta want to open up? I think that's an open question still. They really did want sanctions lifted because I know on the, on the military side, particularly on us of this, I'd always heard that the generals and their families were on the SDN the sanctions list. They can't get into the country, targeted sanctions list, and they wanted to be off it so they could travel to America. But also they weren't happy to be trading with other Asian countries. They wanted to be able to, well, not just with other Asian countries, they wanted to be trading with America. So it's, relations with America is also what they want. I, there are many answers to that, I think, but do you have a better answer than me on that, what people wanted from America? Um. No, I, I don't have a better answer than you. <laughs> well, yeah. It's a great yeah. answer. Back there, last question from the audience. Thank you. Um, Jack Mint with the uh, International Republican Institute. Um, I have a question um, regarding the uh, future of uh, press media in Myanmar. See, we, with the uh, freedom of press in Myanmar, we also see a rise of uh, news medias that don't necessarily report in accordance with truth or journalistic integrity for that matter, especially online news outlets. Um, some of them going so far as to you know, inciting hate speech and, um, and contributing to the, uh, as we see in the Rakhine State riots. Back, uh, back in 2012. So um, as, a, as a journalist yourself, um, wh where do you see this headed in the long run? And uh, what do you think could be the best approach at tackling this? Gosh, I wouldn't be one to prescribe policy. I know I've heard it from journalists in Burma. Well, first of all, I'll start by saying that Burma had the, some of the toughest censorship rules on, on journalism in the world. And they had a press scrutiny board, and everything that was ever printed had to be submitted. Um, and that was abolished in the, in the last couple of years. Um, but throughout that time, you still had journalists who were trying, and who had about, there were about 50 to 100 weekly, monthly journals, really first-tier journalists, some of them, who had studied abroad and found ways to come back, and they couldn't really do real journalism. They had to find metaphorical ways to discuss what was going on. So I'd say there was a, there's a vanguard in Burma of real journalists who really know and who've really studied and who've taught others, and real journalists, sounds like it's elite profession, but um, who, who understand the standards. And I think it's just now that there's a lot less censorship, um, this is a situation that even countries like America face where suddenly anyone can talk online and, and give their thoughts and you often get the fella in the pajama in the middle of the country who can be anonymous and say something really vitriolic and that's a real problem, certainly in Burma. Where that's going now, I think the government hasn't been able to really clamp down and figure out how to deal with hate speech, and they've kind of avoided the topic and won't touch the topic till after the elections. And it's certainly a huge problem because the hate speech, as you say, has incited a lot of visceral hatred towards the, Rakhine, uh, to the Rohingya and the Muslims. One hopes that it'll be tempered and that they'll find a nice balance I don't, I don't know that that's the case. It, it kind of goes together with the whole political reform in Burma. If that's going to keep going forward or if it's sort of about where it'll be. But I think the journalists that are out there in Burma that are already doing work every day are really pushing forward. And they, they're testing the, the limits of this, of, of what, what they can talk about. They're writing about corruption. They're writing about the ethnic insurgencies, even if they're getting thrown in jail. And then, and then they write about that if they're getting thrown in jail. And, and that opens up more opportunities for the media. Delphine, will you go back to Burma? Can you go back to Burma? And what's next for you? What's, what's on the horizon in terms of projects and work? I definitely want to go back to Burma. And I think certainly for the elections, I feel a bit silly talking about what's going to happen in Burma without actually you know, being there very recently. Um, so definitely, if, if I manage to get a visa. But things have changed now. I mean, people who, in the US, the head of the US campaign for Burma was in Burma very recently, and he would never have been allowed. So mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll hope be able to get a back book in. tour in Burma <laughs> I don't know about a book tour but uh, yeah no I mean it'd be nice to be able to bring this and see if people tell me if I'm right and, and if they appreciate this that'd be great um, and then beyond that I don't know I think it's Burma is a difficult place to let go of it everyone I ever know who's ever been there for whatever reason as a luxury tourist or like me as a journalist or an aid worker just comes out of there completely in love with the country it's just heartbreakingly beautiful and its history is so tragic but and the people are so warm, and it's just, it 
I'll never let it go. <laughs> but I'll write about other things, I hope. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, this has been fantastic. I mean, we could go on for, for hours. Um, congratulations on a Thank great you. book. Uh, <laughs> wonderful sort of body of experience and work that you've uh, portrayed. I hope the Rebel of Rangoon makes its way to the American Center, to the library. Uh, and I hope all of you here, as well as those watching, uh, buy a copy and buy uh, copies for your friends and family. It's a great read uh, and incredible work. So thank you, Delphine. Thank you. Thank Join you me in thanking Delphine. <laughs>